um, we have numbers still going up, but I think we can start. Um, like I said, we have a great um, panel for you today. Um, we have a keynote speech from MEP Vilin Anisto, who is a Green MEP from Finland and member of the um, Environment Committee, amongst others. We have Barbara Herrero, who will be speaking, on, who's the EU Nature Policy Officer at BirdLife, um, has an MSc in conservation, and is in charge of following a lot of the implementation on the birds and habitat directives. We have Aki Arikuma, Director of BirdLife Finland since 2011 has a master's in law and is involved in a lot of court cases about derogations of the BIRDS Directive. We have Michael O'Brien, who is the deputy head of the Nature Unit in DG Environment at the European Commission. And then we will also have concluding remarks from Ariel Brunner, who is the acting interim director and head of policy at BirdLife. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Ville to address the panelists, um, the panel and also the attendees. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mira, and, and uh, welcome from uh, my side to everyone also joining uh, this discussion and, and following this debate. Um, Obviously, when it comes to, to biodiversity protection and the protection of, of birds, we are living in a time when we have the mass extinction of species ongoing. And, 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 and this is a very unusual time, very, very fast uh, change in the habitat for the birds and, 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 uh, and uh, for our ecosystems. And today's discussion about the derogations, I think is one good example that we should increase the protection of vulnerable species and instead the governments and countries are looking at loopholes into how they can diminish the, the, the um, further the uh, amounts of, of our birds that we have. So this is very timely discussion and, and I very much thank BirdLife for organizing this. Also, if you look at also uh, how people around Europe are feeling uh, during the COVID pandemic, I think many people, especially in a country like Finland, where you know there has been quarantine measures in cities, but the, the wildlife and national parks and, and nature has been open to people. There's plenty of room for them. So, so more and more people have taken nature observation as a way of, uh, you know, living in these times when, when other uh, recreations are, are limited and they have you know followed the change of seasons from spring to summer from summer to autumn and realized that the beauty of birds as well I had a number of my friends on, on Facebook and on Twitter who are bird watchers nowadays has something like fivefold during this time so I think there is an understanding among the population also uh, that when we are living in a vulnerable time and we need to increase our society's resilience, I think people also understand the value of nature uh, more when, when, when we feel threatened as, as a species, the way we have lived is, is, is uh, under question. I, and I think it applies very much to our relationship with nature as well. So I hope this is something positive that comes out of this crisis that we value uh, also biodiversity as a way of protecting the future of humanity, because there is a link also with pandemics, uh, loss of habitat, loss of wildlife with, with, uh, with the nature protection and the loss of habitat can be, be increased an in, in amount of, of uh, uh, animal-based uh, uh, pandemics. But uh, also according to the latest uh, EEA report on states of the nature in the EU, uh, there is more effective implementation of, of uh, the current environmental legislation needed when, in the, when it comes to the habitats and bird directives. So we should uh, give nature protection equal priority to climate action at the European level. So we shouldn't tackle this separately, but also when we speak about the Green Deal, it should be also a, a green deal for our biodiversity, otherwise we can't uh, sort the climate uh, challenge. And uh, that means the biodiversity tar targets need to be mainstreamed in everything that EU do. One discussion underway is obviously the, the MFF, where we have proposals 
uh, which I also have uh, written a letter personally with colleague MEPs about uh, allocating 10% of the MFP, uh, MFF to, to biodiversity protection. And this is under discussions at the moment with the council, whether that will go through. I think we have the chance of getting something like that through. Uh, so, so there is. This is the broad situation with biodiversity. We have loss of biodiversity, loss of habitat, uh, and and a lot, lot more species are becoming vulnerable. And then we come into the today's top, topic and a closer look at the birds directive. So obviously, the birds directive protects all birds, and in this di uh, directive, some exceptions are allowed to be made. Derogations to kill, trap, or disturb birds, their eggs or their nests can be issued under certain strict circumstances. And if you look at the directive, the circumstances are narrow uh, and very specific. Uh, it could be health related or safety related or research related. Uh, but if you look at this, how it's been implemented in countries, it's very much and widely abused, even in a country like Finland, where I come from. So expect exceptions have become kind of like a commonplace solution to solve issues where people feel that uh, that uh, that a certain num certain uh, uh, species uh, of birds uh, is uh, is uh, uh, increasing in numbers, so the solution is we'll just kill more of them. And if that's not allowed according to the law, then you make a derogation. And this is not what derogations are meant to be used for. If you look at the other way around, we still hunt en endangered species, and there is not a broad discussion in Finland about hunting endangered species. So, so, so too often in public debate, the focus is on there is too much of this one species. What can we do to, you know, limit the, the amount of the species? And at the same time, nobody seems to question in the public debate about the the uh, the endangering uh, of the endangered species that is still happening with legal hunting. So, so I mean, the situation is should be the other way around. We should look at limiting ways of. of using derogations but also increasing protection of species that have become endangered or are in at risk of becoming endangered so this is the situation if you look at at member states that there are uh, very different ways of implementing uh, derogations the, there is a paradoxical situation that uh, many member states don't even report uh, very exactly what they're doing in this area and, uh, and uh, in some places, felling a few trees in a city requires, requires a derogation, but felling thousands of trees in forestry operations during the breeding season does not. There's still widespread uh, 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 tree cutting in Finnish forests, even in uh, old forests sometimes that are not protected, unfortunately, during the breed se breeding season, which can uh, harm, harm the birds uh, quite substantially. So what should be done to these issues? Uh, obviously, currently there is a possibility in many countries like, like Finland for the NGOs to appeal against derogations. And this has happened. We've had tube species in Finland, Marnacle goose and great cormorant that have been widely kind of like abused with the derogations and, and the NGOs have been able to limit this and, and get it more science-based. But the whole approach is wrong. There should be other solutions that are prioritized instead of derogations. And there is also science that derogations of, of lowering numbers of birds in a, in a certain space actually does not affect um, the, the, the uh, problems that they are uh, supposed to, to cause. So then you should look at the more ecosystem-based approach that may be the fishing stocks have depleted due to other reasons than, 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 uh, than blaming certain birds for that. So I think there should be a biodiversity-based assessments on how ecosystems can be protected and not looking at derogations always as a first measure. And this is not according to the current regulation. So for the European Commission, it's important that they ensure complete and functional reporting of derogations currently. They also implement that they are effectively uh, used only as as uh, as, as uh, uh, last uh, 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 solution of last resort, and also further research is needed to investigate population impact of derogations. So this is uh, what I would like to say at the beginning of the discussion, and I hope that we have a very fruitful debate, and also the Commission may learn something from this, because I I think that the Commission needs to be more active on this, because member states obviously need to be, you know, pushed on this to, for, for a change to happen. So thank you from my side.
Thank you so much, Willie. And there's so much uh, food for thought there, especially the holistic approach is really, really, I think not just in terms of protecting birds, but just in terms of entire, we all are a part of the ecosystem. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, well, now we have um, two excellent speakers who are presenting findings of a very important report. Um, so um, I would like to invite um, Barbara first to present some of the findings and also maybe some of the um, solutions that came about. Thank you, um, Mira. Um, let me just share my screen so I can share my presentation. Um, uh, huh. And please don't miss the nice title, <laughs> License to Kill. Oh no, I'm having trouble seeing. Um, I think um, everyone can see it, so. Yeah, I just need to put it on presenter mode, but I have, I was trying to outsmart Zoom. <laughs> and now I have too many windows open. Um, Great, looks good. And let me yeah, put it in here. Um, excellent. So indeed, we are releasing today our report, uh, License to Kill, on how the EU member states um, abuse their power to, and grant licenses to kill actually millions of birds. Um, the report, uh, both uh, the full version with all the um, sad details and um, our short shorter briefing um, will be shared in the chat at the end of the event. Um, so don't leave before before that's done. Up. Um, what have we done in this report? We have uh, reviewed the ECJ rulings on the birds directive um, on derogations published until the end of 2018. Um, we have analyzed all the derogations uh, published in Habides, that's the um, uh, reporting tool that was developed to help member states um, uh, put uh, together their obligation on reporting. And we analyzed um, the, their contributions between 2009 and 2017, and that spans basically two habitus systems. Um, an older one from before 2015, I, I think it was, and the Habitus Plus version, which um, came after that. We also analyzed the reports to Iowa and Bern, and, uh, but this event focused mainly on the EU um, report. And then we also looked at eight case studies in depth um, of eight member states across um, the EU to understand a little bit better how their uh, in-depth stories um, compared with their uh, official reports. Um, how did we do this? Um, so we we reviewed 17 ECJ cases. Um, we analyzed all of the Habitus entries, Habitus and Habitus Plus entries from between 2009 and 2017 to understand the level of take under derogations, understand um, understand a little bit how member states uh, reported, it, reported them overall. And then we did a statistical analysis um, on habitus entries to understand the different types of derogations issued. Um, and we, uh, we, how we went into looking at those case studies is we have asked 
our BirdLife partners who have a uh, long-standing experience in dealing with um, derogations, as we will hear from uh, my colleague from Finland later on. Um, uh, and, and we asked them what did they know about it and how it compared with the official reports. Um, so just a bit of a recap, and I think um, Ville already um, mentioned it a little bit, so I'll go very fast. Uh, derogations can basically be very limited in time and, and place, and they need to be limited to what is strictly necessary. All alternatives to killing need to have been exhausted, so you need to prove that there is no other way than killing a bird to uh, make sure that you that you can issue your derogation. Um, derogations can be issued for air safety, they can be issued for um, damage control, they can be issued for research purposes. Um, if you need to kill them, you, you need to show that that's the only way to address your problem. Um, and in order for, for derogations to be able to, uh, for you to issue a certain derogation, you need to ensure that you have the necessary controls, that you have the authorities in charge, that issue the derogations, that can go to the field and check the derogations are applied a, like they are supposed to be applied, um, etc. There are um, there are a number of um, things that have a bit more specific um, uh, where the, the the court went a bit more specific. So on on damage control, um, this damage needs to be serious. You need to prove that the damage is serious enough for you to be able to to kill uh, birds. Um, the scope of the derogation needs to be in line with the damage to address. So you cannot um, uh, just say that you can, do, that you can kill all of the birds um, uh, because you think they might be they might be damaging you need to prove that the damage is caused by a certain species so for example a uh, hunting season uh, is not specific enough um, to ensure that um, to ensure that the targeting of the damage prevention and then we have small numbers derogations um, which need to also follow a set of other rules amongst which is this 1% rule. So you can only um, kill less than 1% um, of, of, um, of the species population. Um, you need to ensure that the derogation doesn't affect um, the, that, that you need to ensure that the species population is maintained. And you're not allowed for the population to, to use a dero to open derogations in small numbers if the population is declining or trends are unknown. So this is a bit a recap of the ECJ rulings review. Um, what came out from our analysis? So between 2009 and 2017, there were 84,000 derogations issued by all member states. There were 14 million birds killed. And remember, I will explain you why, but this is the lower end um, of the range of uh, potential birds killed. Um, and 18 derogations issued killed or took more than 100,000 birds in four member states. And those were Italy, Spain, France, and Denmark. In Denmark. So it's hardly targeted and proportionate. Um, yet, member states reported these derogations and nothing um, much happened. So the most um, killed or taken bird species are feral pigeons, wood pigeons, uh, common starling, the carrion crow, um, and the gray lag goose. Um,
So one of our main findings is that um, the reports themselves, these mandatory reports that member states have to submit are full of gaps. They're not only obscure little gaps. There's, there's member states that have not submitted full reports for various years in a row. So in, in the tranche that we analyzed, there's 39 full reports missing. Um, there's important, so, and within the reports that have been submitted, there's important information missing. So, and that's of, that's 22% of derogations reported have major gaps. And major gaps means that there's either no numbers of birds reported, which have to, or numbers of birds taken or killed or their nests affected. Um, for example, all of the Irish derogations miss this um, important item. Um, some of them don't have the species identified. Some of them clump species together. Uh, some of them legal, don't have legal justifications. They omit the numbers of birds. Uh, they don't assess any alternatives. Um, there are no details on how the different authorities will control these derogations. And remember, all of these are supposed to be mandatory for member states to report on, yet they're not nowhere to be seen. Um, what other information gaps are there? There's um, unexplained variation in number of derogations issued. So, I mean, it's um, normal, for example, that Germany issues more derogations than Luxembourg uh, per year. But it's not normal that Romania, which is a large country, um, issues less derogations than Luxembourg, for instance, or that. France issues a full degree of magnitude fewer derogations than Germany. Um, that's just not normal. And but nothing happens. No one goes and look around. No, no one with the power to do so goes around and, and looks at why this is happening and why those differences are so stark. Um, Something else that we found is that um, um, there's a huge overlap between derogations and hunting seasons. And again, this has been uh, ruled by the Court of Justice like it shouldn't be so. Um, and there's a lot of muddling of reasons to issue derogations. Um, so over 5,000 derogations gave more than one legal justification, which then makes it almost impossible to assess uh, the alternatives to, to, to those um, derogations. If you are saying that um, uh, the birds are causing damage, but you also uh, um, causing damage to, to agriculture, but also uh, you need to do some research. It, you cannot prove that you, why you would need to kill them if you can only catch them, for example. Um, something else we found is that, um, so the most common derogations reported were uh, ringing birds, construction works and maintenance, prevention of damage to crops and prevention to damage to fisheries. Um, construction works is one example of conditional intent, um, which means that, um, and conditional intent is used in some cases as a reason to issue derogations, um, where an activity will by itself cause the death of some birds. So member states are reporting construction works and maintenance, but there's no member state that reports um, killing birds for forestry, for agricultural practices, and for a bycatch in fisheries activities, which is very odd. Um, um, there is one case of uh, concern. 
um, it's a great cormorant. Um, between 2009 and 2017, there were between 350,000 and 4,400,000 birds killed um, from a breeding population in the reports of 2015, um, a minimum of 223,000. Um, and a wintering population of uh, 384. That's basically um, taking between 7.8 and 10% of the total wintering population every year, which is likely to be causing population control of the species in at least some member states, um, which again, shouldn't be happening. Remember, a great cormorants are non-huntable species, so they they should be protected all year round. Um, why is this outrageous? Uh, we are in the middle of um, biodiversity crisis. We cannot continue closing our eyes to the enormity of the task ahead, um, and we need to make sure that we know what is happening. We need to, to, to look at the data that we are receiving um, and analyze it and act upon it. Um, everyone, all member states, all stakeholders need to make sure that they at least comply with the law, which is uh, not the case. Because basically, the rule of law um, is at stake here. If we do not take things like reporting on exceptions seriously, then um, then it's a free for all. Um, and we need to make sure that member states are accountable for their actions and for what they are allowing, um, because otherwise we can't, um, we can't even start addressing the biodiversity crisis, the, clim the climate crisis um, and all the rest of it. Um, so you will be able to see in our uh, recommendations, um, we need to investigate the population impacts. We need to put the machinery in place to do that. We uh, would ask, again, the Commission to update um, the guidance on species, species protections and in include derogation under the BIRDS Directive um, to ensure clarity on what the scope of activities um, are allowed and, um, and on protection. We um, so all mandatory information needs to be submitted. I know the commission will be presenting what they're doing. Um, we need to start investigating and address why some member states and regions issue some derogations and others not. Why some member states and, um, issue derogations for some activities and others not. Why some major sectors are completely omitted from derogations when we know they are a cause of major disturbance and, and, and death of birds. Um, so our main recommendation really is that um, the commission needs to, to take uh, infringing member states to court. Um, it will make member states listen to the recommendations of our bird life partners at national level. Um, and just to say that um, a, a wiggle in a meeting full of statisticians, ecological statisticians twice a year and um, sad emojis in a presentation will not make member states um, <laughs> act with the law. We need to take them to court and uh, the Commission needs to take them to court and the Commission needs to um, take its role seriously and start enforcing um, the Bridge Directive. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks, I think. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, that uh, some of the numbers are really, really shocking. Um, and yeah, like you said, we are in a biodiversity crisis within a climate crisis and a pandemic and everything is kind of coming together. So it's important that a holistic approach is taken and that these things are taken seriously. 
Um, and now I would like to invite Aki, um, who is going to present a specific case study from Finland. And after his presentation, we'll do a short Q and A, um, if time permits, um, to, for people to ask questions directly on the report before moving on. Okay, hello everybody and, and greetings from Finland. This time from the living room, living room. Last week I was mainly in the bedroom, but maybe this is really same situation with you that your flight has been more familiar these days. Okay, is my presentation on screen? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, We've been working with the derogations fairly much during the decades. And uh, the, the path has been fairly rocky or, or stony. It's not been very, very clear path in every, every part or every phase. Uh, we almost, we have had to have some kind of intervention to this process. Uh, the BIRDS directive uh, and the articles has been fairly well adapted in the Finnish legislation, but uh, many times the implementation is done by the minimum level. And this, this is the phase where we, we have been in contact with the Finnish authorities or regime or the commission for instance, uh, 95, when we be became a member of uh, so-called unprotected species, which are, which are a couple of gull and corvid species, which are under the Game, game Act, but the uh, Hunting Act, but they are not game species. Uh, they get their breeding seasons uh, protected, although the Finnish, Finland's government proposed to short period and we were able to show from our bird station material that this is too short period. The migration period is much, 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 much longer and which forced Finnish government to prolong the, the, the protection period. So this is sort of a first protection conservation victory about the derogation issues. And, and this kind of, Procedure uh, continued year after year, although we got uh, new legislation, but then there still was uh, old structures that the authorities had uh, old habits which they refused to abandon. So, so the authorities were more or less a derogation automatics. If you apply something, you get a license. You didn't have to have any good arguments for it. You just need to use some some basic words, right words, and you get the license. So the processes were very categorized. And uh, due to this process, many times uh, during the latest years, they were killed as many birds with the derogations as they were killed birds outside the protection area, uh, the protection time when the, when the hunting was or killing was free. So you can ask uh, whether these were derogations were, or were they general, general part of the legislation that allowed to kill birds. The protection of the nests in Finland is, is, is I would say, uh, well, fairly good, in a fairly good situation. If you think about the general issue, taking eggs and destroying nests, nests intentionally is prohib prohibited. And this, this is in practice only in the breeding time. Another time the, the nests are not protected. Uh, forestry is an exception to this. As mentioned before, tens of thousands of nests are destroyed by the forestry during the breeding season. Now we have a new court ruling about this issue and we will see what, what's going to be the, the, the new implementation or the, the, how, how the, the practice will change due to this. 
uh, nests that are, that are annually used are protected only if the authorities mark the breeding trees or there is a nest of, uh, for an eagle or osprey and uh, the nest is clearly visible. Eider has been a, a blind spot to, to in Finland. Uh, this spring, we got the judgment from the EU court, which, which uh, prohibited the spring hunt of the male aiders. Uh, it took nine years from the notification to commission to get the decision from the EU court. And that is, is way too long time. As we see, this case was fairly easy because the same issue was already in the court five years earlier. And, and the protection status of either has gotten worse since then. But anyhow, it took nine years. It's way too long a period that we were many times very frustrated about how, how it, how, why it takes so many years to go to the court and get the decision. Um, still, the hunting of male aiders is allowed in the beginning of June in the continental area of Finland. Uh, this is very, very sensitive time because it's a time of incubation and then the aiders of small chicks. And also it's very sensitive because the other bird species and many of them red listed are breeding in the same area where the male eiders are hunted. And this of course disturbs other species and also aiders because the aider females and the chicks have to swim to the open sea from the, from the island shoreline, shorelines and they are and they are there unprotected from the predators and that of, co of course causes disturbance and disturbance and, 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 and killings of the earth to chicks. And to mention that the aider is endangered in Finland and in the EU, it's vulnerable in Europe and it's globally near threatened species. A raven issue, raven is not in the annex two of bird di directive, birds directive. Uh, in Finland, it's unprotected in the reindeer husbandry area, which covers 40% of, of Finland. Uh, it has only protection in the, from the April to, to July. So that, that is a really a, a, a gap in the, the leg legislation. And this has also been not noticed to, to commission. Uh, about uh, Article 9 derogations to kill in Finland, there are two authorities. Uh, nature protection uh, authorities uh, take care of the protected species and then the Finnish wild, Wildlife Agency takes care of the game and these so-called unprotected species. And then this has uh, caused two different views for killings. Or here, my presentation number one refers to the to the uh, protection uh, nature conservation authorities. Uh, for them, the, they ask also always that is it a good and essential, essential solution to, to, to give a derogation? Are there any other options to do? That's very basic for them. But with the game wildlife agency, the derogation is many times the obvious solution for the problem. They don't investigate very much if there is uh, some other kind of satisf satisfactory solution for the problem. So same issue to two, two different authorities and uh, two different views how to implement BERT's directive. Uh, there's been progress. As I mentioned earlier, the spring hunt of the Eider Aiders ended this year. Uh, licenses to kill unprotected species during the, spe uh, to, during the breeding season. 
there are no general licenses to kill corvids and gulls. Uh, this, this has, these decisions have come from the Supreme Administrative Court from Finland. We've been, we've been there many times. Uh, also, the number of the individuals in the licenses has decreased due to Supreme Court decisions. So there is a, so these court decisions have forced authorities to to change their habits a bit. And, and now there is a reformation of the Nature Conservation Act, and then there is a, probably and hopefully better protection coming to nests also. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aki. Um, so just uh, keeping in mind the time, we're a bit behind schedule. So um, I'm going to switch things up a bit. I'm going to actually now invite uh, Michael O'Brien from the European Commission uh, to tell us about what the Commission is doing about the situation. And then we'll open up for a discussion and um, have the Q&A. So Michael, you have the floor, thanks. Thank you. Um, still seeing beautiful pictures of Velvet Scoter. <laughs> um, I hope you can hear me if you can't see me. Um, firstly, we welcome the report. We thank BirdLife for this work. It certainly puts a, a spotlight on the need to improve the application and uh, reporting of derogations under the birds directive. That doesn't come as a surprise to us in the uh, commission because obviously we're already having that conversation and acting upon it in terms of our day-to-day -day work. Um, but we will study the um, report carefully um, and also the recommendations that are made um, in it in relation to actions that the BirdLife would like to see the Commission follow up on. Um, the, bird life, uh, the BIRDS Directive does provide a, a, a comprehensive framework for the conservation of all uh, wild birds. Um, and the derogation system has to be seen in the context of that universal application of species protection in that it does allow for some flexibility on the protection regime, not only under Article 5 on strict protection, but also in relation to the other species related articles on commercialization in relation to hunting and in relation to trapping methods. But as has already been said, it is an exception to the rule of law and therefore has to be clearly and narrowly defined um, and carried out in accordance with the requirements of Article 9. Now, um, the BIRDS Directive also, unlike the Habitats Directive, is requiring an annual uh, report from the member states. It's an annual requirement rather than a two-yearly requirement in an agreed format. And of course, the most obvious breach in relation to the duty of the derogation is a failure to report. And as, as Barbara has highlighted, you know, in terms of the analysis that some countries are extremely tardy in terms of even the fundamentals of reporting. And I think Greece was highlighted as an example, um, but it's not the only one. And um, I mean, we did take legal action against Greece in relation to a persistent failure to report. And I don't know if it's picked up in the report, but now Greece has provided reports for all of the years up to 2018. So that does trigger a response. And I mean, that's a fundamental duty in relation uh, to a reporting. Given that there's a need for an agreed format, we have tried to improve over time the issue of the um, format, the issue of going into a digital era so we would have online reporting and there was happy days and now there's happy days plus. Um, you refer to happy days too, but it's, it's we, we understand it as happy days plus. Uh, Sofia Pascini, who I think is also participating, monitors this in terms of our work internally in the unit. But this is a tool 
that has been developed um, together with the Bern Convention for the Council of Europe because there is a joint derogation system and we wanted to ease the reporting burden on member states so that they report once for two legal ob obligations. And of course, it's a work that's done with the European Environment Agency. So we believe that the system that has been developed, it may not be perfect, but it is sufficient in order to get critical information in relation to implementation of these provisions. And I know that the uh, report, and we can come back to this, is critical in saying that the earlier version is better than this version. Um, there is still a duty um, to report in relation to the number of individuals, uh, the maximum number of individuals. And there is a request to member states to provide a description of the derogations, information of controls and alternatives. And that does come up in terms of the questions that the commission asks of the member states in relation to the report. Because every time we do get a report, we do assess it. And we have the assistance of consultants that help us with assess it in terms of the completeness and quality of the, of the report itself. We look at the different, into the different categories of uh, derogations. Um, we're particularly uh, interested in terms of any impacts on species. And I'll come back to that in a moment in terms of what you say in the report on impacts on species, because clearly that's a fundamental requirement that a use of a derogation shouldn't be detrimental to the conservation objectives of the directive. We have consistently focused in particular on the Article 91C, where this issue of judicious use and the issue of small numbers, and that is an, an issue that comes overlaps with the debate on hunting beyond the normal period. Um, so that we do have a systematic um, examination of the reports. And on the base of that, we've been providing feedback to the member states where we believe that there are serious inconsistencies in relation to the completeness of the report, and you've highlighted that in yours, and in relation to the quality of information that has been provided. Um, it's also raised uh, systematically in the bi nature bilaterals that we have launched with the member states. Now we've organized this as, uh, as a follow-up to the nature fitness check uh, the Nature Action Plan to try and sit down with the member state authorities and with stakeholder communities to actually ensure we get better implementation. And this issue of derogation, the need to improve quality and completeness of the reports is part of that. With this online reporting format, we are also moving towards improving the transparency of the process at a European level. In, uh, we're developing an online search interface to access and view the information included in the official reports. This is developed with the European Environment Agency and will be hosted on their website. And it will begin, hopefully this transparency will be a driver for improvement and addressing gaps. And this should be available as a tool online in the coming weeks. So I think this is a, an important positive development. And of course, it should be used by you and others in terms of raising the profile of this matter. Now, as regards the impact on species population arising from derogations, I mean, we've always taken this matter seriously. And you know, in the case, in the case for example, of the turtle dove, the issue of spring hunting, there was a, the commission went to court on this and in relation to the quail, the court uh, uh, allowed for some limited hunting but of course, it was also linked to the conservation status of the species, which has further deteriorated. And on the basis of that, the issue of spring hunting of um, turtle dove under a derogation is no longer allowed. In the past, those of you with a long memory will remember debates on the Orkland bunting in France, where uh, senior politicians took great delight in eating this species, but of its conservation status, that has always been a, a pressure point in terms of applying the directive and that it wasn't justified as a derogation. Now you raised the cormorant and the Brent goose. And of course, you know, we've looked at the article 12 reports in terms of member states reporting, and it doesn't appear to us that there is a short-term or a long-term conservation problem here. Um, but of course, we're open to exploring this with bird life in terms of what the data may say and to see in the context of 
whether um, there is a serious risk to those species arising from the from the use of derogations. And the cormorant is probably of all the species, I mean, it's highlighted in your report, of all the species, it is certainly the, the most controversial one that we've had to deal with over the years. And I've had to go to the European Parliament on more than one occasion to defend the cormorant, where not every MEP loves the, the, this species. And we've had requests for its, being, its protection status to be removed and for much greater flexibility in relation to this species. Now we have had a dedicated work that has been, we set up a cormorant platform. We've tried to improve the conservation science, the population estimates, the issue of preventive measures. And we've also uh, produced guidance so that member states, if they want to use derogations and they're not required to use derogations, it's an option, not an obligation. Um, do have that opportunity. And therefore, in terms of the comment, we've tried to focus in where we see there's a serious com conflict. Likewise, in relation to the issue of hunting, and of course, you know, this risk of overlap between hunting and derogations, they are two separate issues in our view in relation to uh, the rule of law. But we have issued guidance on hunting under the birds directive, including where we see the issue of um, derogations under 9.1c of the Birds Directive, how they would be applied. And that's the basis, taking on board all the jurisprudence of, of the court, where we see the limitations, and they are very limited, not only an issue of small quantities, but also in relation to the possibility in itself. We've engaged with uh, colleagues in the AWA Secretariat in relation to the ongoing debate on geese, particularly on the barnacle goose, where there's an international um, management plan being developed for this species. And it's very controversial as um, the member of parliament will know in relation to Finland in last spring, we heard all these reports about serious damage by barnacle geese uh, in Finland. Um, so we have consistently in our debate, and I know that Sergei Dereliev is, is also participating in this um, webinar, we've, we've tried to ensure that this international plan is fully consistent with the derogation legal requirements under the Birds Directive, as far as the um, um, EU countries are concerned. So that's where we are in terms of uh, uh, guidance on explicit issues related to the Birds Directive. Of course, we're in the process of updating our guidance under the Habitats Directive for Species Protection. And there is a crossover there clearly in relation to many of the provisions and of the understandings. And we would hope when that's complete and it's at the final stages at the moment, that this will also assist in correctly interpreting related provisions uh, under the BIRDS Directive. And I know there are issues that are raised such as the issue of bycatch, which BirdLife has a, requested a meeting with the commission in the coming weeks and we will discuss more fully. Um, there are differences between the Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive, which make this more complicated as well. Um, so we, we have to navigate our way through that. Finally, can I just get on to the point of enforcement? The Commission, uh, despite what you might think, takes these matters very seriously and is over the years carried out a huge amount of enforcement action in relation to the birds and the uh, Habitats Directive um, within what I would argue are uh, increasingly limited human capacity to do so. Um, now we have to apply this strategically within the limits of our resources. And we have in relation to species protection provisions under the Birds Directive and the issue of derogations not only about the failure to report, but in relation to how the derogations are applied. For example, in relation to the issue of spring hunting, we've taken legal action against Finland. We've taken legal action against Malta. We've taken legal action against Austria in the not too distant past. In relation to the issue of finch trapping, we've taken legal action against uh, Malta and against Spain. So we tend to focus strategically on those areas where we feel that the EU uh, Commission effort and our capacity is most strategically uh, useful. 
Now, our current priorities for enforcement are set out in the new EU biodiversity strategy. Um, we will focus on completing Natura and making sure that it's not paper parks, but it's effectively managed. We will obviously look at the issue of species protection provisions, particularly where we see that species are in trouble and declining. And that's something that we will have to um, uh, look at more in the context of seeing if there's any link to the, the derogations issue. We, we ask BirdLife and all the people concerned that it, to make full use of the national redress, the national legal processes. And we heard that in relation to Finland, this is being availed of insofar as you can. And certainly that is an important thing that we would urge you, and maybe that should be more prominently highlighted in your recommendations, not only to collect information to bring to the commission, but also to use the actual national system. So in conclusion, we certainly recognize that this is an issue for a directive that's been around a while and it's a continuing problem. We are committed to continue to address this. The new transparency that will be brought into the process very shortly and will help in terms of putting this under a greater spotlight and your report and the work that BirdLife does, which is extraordinarily valuable, will hopefully make serious progress, help make serious progress on this in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to bring in Lele before he has to leave, just to respond real quick to what you heard. Okay, well, to start with, I think the report is very useful for us as members of parliament, but also for the commission to, to realize the scope of the problems that we have. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that the commission takes this seriously, because that's, you know, that's the precondition for, for tackling a lot of the issues that are, are problematic with derogations. I would just like to end up by end by saying I know that the Commission has already in a country like Finland. I, I used to be Minister of the Environment, so I know the problems that we have. Since a lot of the jurisdiction and the power is actually in the Ministry of the Agriculture, so Ministry of the Environment actually tries to explain to to, to the uh, Commission. Uh, why things are happening which they actually don't agree on. So we do have a problem nationally as well that another ministry tries to do policies that, that even the Ministry of the Environment does not think is very well in line with the purpose directive. So this is a national problem. I think this applies to all member states. I know that the Commission has taken some action and I'm happy for that because that's their, their job. But I think the, the main message I have is that there should be better guidance on other alternatives than derogations to problems. Uh, like, like this should be always a right focus that, that the action taken is supportive of biodiversity and, and in right scale to, 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 to in relation to the problem, if there is a problem to start with. Sometimes problems are imaginary and have to do with human overconsumption and, and not problems created by birds. So we need to take science on board there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Um, Aki, wondered if you wanted to come in briefly before we move on to the Q&A. Um, There's a bit of delay in the There was a delay in, can, can you repeat? Yeah, I wondered if you wanted to respond to what you heard um, from Michael and Real brief, yeah, real quick. Well, yeah, I think the 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 national procedures are important, and, and I think that uh, that those must our 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 NGOs in in the in the different EU countries should be very active, and we should also share this information among the BirdLife partnership, um, and. Uh, that's 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 I think the primary issue to do. But yes, it's good to hear that uh, you take this issue seriously. One which I would like to ask is that uh, why these processes take so long time? Nine years in one case, it's it's exceptionally long time. Can you open this a little bit? Yeah. Um, before we do that, I'd like to uh, bring Barbara in. Just if you have, want to respond or have a question, so that. Uh, Michael can answer them together and then um, I'll bring in other questions. Yeah, Michal, thanks uh, a lot for that uh, uh, big overview. I do have um, a question saying that 
um, the, the problems that we have reported on are not new to you, um, that these are problems that are seemingly acro happening across the board, all these information gaps or all of these misapplications of the derogations. Um, wouldn't it be strategic to deal with um, trying to understand the full scale of um, how much derogations impact bird populations to be able to say that, you know, that you're actually taking a, a, a full um, spectrum approach to, to, to this problem. Um, I mean, it's, it's important to go to the targeted um, interventions, but if the problems are so major, um, when will you act upon that? Great, thank you. Um, apologies again, I kept saying, Michael, when it's Michal, apologies for that. Um, please go ahead if you wanted to, to uh, respond. And then um, we have some questions that are further addressed to you, Michal, and then also to Barbara. And I can... yeah. No, no, thanks for the questions. And um, well, firstly, on the thing about taking too long, I'm sorry if it takes too long. It does actually, it's, it's, it's a dispute procedure. I mean, the purpose of an infringement against a member state is not to actually get a court ruling. It's actually to resolve a problem. That's the, the way it works. And there are different stages that you go through in relation to that in terms of uh, building a case, uh, there's sometimes a pre-contentious phase, then there's a letter of formal notice, then there's a reasoned opinion stage, then there's an issue of court application, and sometimes it takes sev several years in relation to, uh, and there's a, sometimes a shifting ground because the country's situation is evolving in the context of that. Nine years is probably on the long side in relation to these procedures, um, and so therefore I, I I'm, I'm, I'm careful about commenting on a specific situation, but the, the, the um, issue of enforcement is not a quick fix. It's actually something that does require uh, a lot of work. A lot of people in the commission have to be involved. Um, and there's also a burden of proof on the commission in terms of putting together um, the whole evidence base that is required. So, um, and normally there's a breathing space given to the member state to respond in a way that complies rather than waiting until these matters go to the court. But yeah, I, I, don't, I don't defend nine years as, and I think it's too long, um, but it, it certainly does take time and it's, that's something we should bear in mind. Um, yeah, Barbara's point about, we know about these problems and in relation to the impact of them, um, we are working on it, um, and of course, you know, a lot of our work is on compliance promotion in terms of working, getting the information, getting the guidance out there, and enforcement is a measure of last resort. Um, your point about the impact on bird populations, um, honestly, I would put my hand up and say I've been in the Commission since 1992, and if ever I thought there was a derogation having a, a population impact on a species, that would have been a trigger for action if I thought there was a real conservation uh, problem um, that was there. Um, that doesn't justify not dealing with the systemic issues, but in terms of the issue of population impact, you know, there is a debate about hunting, there's a debate about illegal killing which um, raises questions about the sustainability of hunting. And of course, illegal killing is not admissible under any uh, sense. Um, but let's continue this conversation in relation to the population impact of uh, derogations in relation to the examples that you've used or other ones that you would want to put on the table at national or um, EU level in relation to what you may feel are serious risks to the conservation of a species. Now that's one dimension of the debate. There is also the issue, of course, about the fact that 
the law has to be applied. You shouldn't wait until species decline until you get a, a correct application of law. But we should certainly never let a derogation be allowed where it's actually having a um, detrimental impact and where we can see that it's happening in terms of a species. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, maybe others want to come in on that, but just before we do, I actually had questions that were posed that I wanted to uh, pose to the other panelists. And then um, um, the first question is for you, uh, Barbara. Um, and maybe this is now uh, been covered, but maybe if you could elaborate, um, because you say that the bad reporting on the derogations under the directive has impacted the rule of law. And so um, could you explain a bit more how much how do, is that of relevance when we're in one case talking about species and their con conservation and the impact on species and then you also um, in the report um, brought in the rule of law. So if you could talk about that and then um, I, I guess take the, a minute to respond to Michal too at the same time. Thanks, Mira. Um, so why does it affect the rule of law? I think the, um, the reason is that um, once you start eroding um, on, on, once you don't explain um, what you're doing, once you start um, a, not reporting on things like how many birds you're killing um, in agriculture, where there should be derogations and there aren't, um, because no one reports on them. When you start um, using the exceptions to continue with your business as usual, you erode the trust on those that are actually um, trying to apply the law well, you, um, and the whole system crumbles. So if you have put a series of measures to make sure that derogations are limited in scope, limited in take, limited in area, you don't report on those things that are extensive um, and have big impacts. You report only on those that, um, if you report on, on sort of the, the, the smaller things or the things that, you know, research, um, ringing is the major, the most reported um, a derogation for all member states. Um, you don't really know where you are. So to respond to Mijo, I mean, it's maybe you're not looking at the caps, at the gaps that they exist in the data that is being reported to you. And that's part of the, of the problem. You don't know really if there are impacts in population because you don't know the numbers. You have many reports missing. You have uh, the information that would give you these numbers on impacts on species are not there. Um, so it's practically impossible for, for you, for us to assess that impact. And that is the problem. And that is what we need to address. We need to start understanding what is being done to our nature. And until we have a clear picture, and until we make member states invest in the commission to follow that process and in their own processes to understand what the problem is, we won't have, we, we will just have um, a veil in front of our eyes and continue as if nothing is happening, but but it is happening and birds are being hunted and they're being illegally killed and they're suffering from habitat loss and they're being issued, there are derogations issued on them 
or they're being killed without anyone taking note. And that is the problem. And if we don't know, then biodiversity is not going to get any better. Um, and people are just going to uh, jump on the bandwagon and continue with business as usual because, because they can. And if nobody does anything on derogations, why would they, why would they care for, for respecting the rest of the birds directive? Thank you so much for that. Um, Aki, um, you were talking about earlier the court case that took nine years. I was uh, wondering whether um, the results of the case were what you expected or what the results were from that. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, yes, the, we were pleased about the decision. It was, it was good. There were a couple of points which, which we criticized. Well, the, the, the length of the process was very long. And then, as I told before, this case, spring hunting of male eiders, has already been in the EU court five years earlier, and they got the verdict to that. And despite of that, it took nine years to, to have a new new judgment from the court. That was what we criticized. <clears throat> well, there are some, some issues you can talk about which are a little bit detailed, but we think that the possibility to hunt in autumn is an option, satisfactory option. And that was not the scope of this, this trial. And, and, and so that was not investigated, but we, we think that that's a relevant, relevant argument still that if the, if the cons conservation status of the bird is good, uh, in, in all and the uh, hunting of the aiders in autumn is, an, is a satisfactory option. So that's also the reason to stop spring hunting. Thank you. Um, Miho, there was a question for you. Um, there, well, there's several questions uh, for you. Um, one of them was that um, you've already put forward some changes in the reporting system um, and making the information or lack of information public um, do you really think, and I think you've uh, answered that uh, partially, but do you think that this is going to have the impact that you're hoping to have and um, in your conversations with um, NGOs like BirdLife, um, were any of their suggestions taken on board? Uh, because um, even in the comments, there was a suggestion to look at um, rather promoting bird scaring methods or other technical solutions um, that could that are used as best practices or could become uh, best practices um, instead of the need for derogations. Um, <clears throat> interesting question, and of course, a derogation um, should be in the absence of other satisfactory solutions. And um, I mean, the example I used of the cormorant is one whereby we trying to build on the best conservation science available, we're uh, strongly advocating that there are preventive measures, scaring methods and um, other deterrents. So therefore, a derogation should be reframed in, 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 in that context. There's also the debate on the geese in terms of actually, um, whereby, you know, you should obviously be able to reasonably demonstrate that you've taken measures to avoid um, lethal control. I mean, because lethal control should not be the uh, preferred measure, but um, we still allow and accept that member states um, have to make these judgments. I mean, these are, the directive is addressed to the countries. They have to exercise their responsibilities and um, to, to, to take um, the measures in accordance with that. And the increased transparency that we see coming into the process. Um, I mean, uh, I think this is really important. The fact that you now have put together your report, also putting the spotlight on the process. We're already providing feedback to the countries um, saying, look, you need to improve the quality and the completeness of these reports. 
I think the more that there is a debate in the countries, not only in, in Brussels or on the webinars in Brussels, um, that the more we bring a focus on this, the better in terms of actually saying, well, there are alternatives, but we need the correct application. I think that will certainly improve the situation, but um, it, it will require those national debates as well. And I, re I really think that um, it would be a mistake to think that this is simply a, 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 a problem for the European Commission to uh, take legal action against 27 member states um, for failure to provide complete reports of derogation. It really, um, in my view, um, does require national debates and for the BirdLife partners and others to bring this into a spotlight at national level. Thank you. Um, I know Barbara wanted to come in and then we also have um, hand raised from one of uh, the attendees, Una from BirdLife, uh, BirdWatch Ireland. So Barbara briefly and then yeah, briefly. Yeah. So just, uh, Michal, one of the things we've noticed in, in this report, I didn't get the chance to go into that much detail in my already long presentation, but um, is that there uh, is a, um, a level of regionalization um, in issuing derogations. So some member states issue some derogations that on things that happen everywhere, but are not derogated on elsewhere and this can happen also at the regional level so um, I think one of the the question is okay um, how can we make sure that the information available to those that are not derogating against a, an exception because there are alternatives how can that knowledge be shared across the member states and whether you in the commission are planning to, to set in motion something that would help um, member states uh, learn from each other, regions learn from each other, um, etc. I think that was um, what was referred to in one of the questions in the Q&A box um, that's, that we wanted to, to get your atten attention on. Um, yeah, if Una can come in and then you could answer both those questions together. Michal. So um, I, I don't know if um, participants are allowed to use their microphone. Can that be? Yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you, because I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself there. That's great, Mira. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, Michal. It's great to see you. Uh, um, not performing so well in its reporting, um, but also um, is is not um, reporting on any numbers of bird species killed. Um, and you know, the, we've looked at some of the um, access to information on the environment requests. Uh, we've had to put in access in, in, on the uh, to information on the environment requests to get information because none of that is published and there's no public consultation on the derogations, but um, it's, it's clear to us that the government that information. So there's, there's, a, there's a monitoring issue here. It's because there is, there, there, the applicants are not being asked to send in numbers. So therefore there's nothing to report. Um, and so we also have some concerns about um, transposition of the of the article 9 into irish law um and we don't believe that it's a, 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 a where it should be uh, to put it mildly so it's um it's it's an area that um we certainly value this report and we provided input to it um but it is of frustration that you know we, we need to see all of the aspects of the, the birds directive implemented at national level and having the European Commission be able to look over the shoulder of the member state is so important because despite many years of you know advocacy still the national governments might not be so keen um, to to take action so that 
that oversight role of the commission is hugely valuable and we we totally understand um, the capacity issues within the commission and the uh, selective nature that you need to take um, but it's um, it is it is it's just difficult uh, so having your help is is really 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 appreciated thanks thank you so much so, Michal you can respond okay um Firstly, in relation to the regionalization of issuing derogations, yes, countries do have regional structures. I mean, like for hunting, for derogations, you may have in a country like uh, Italy or Spain, a regional decision-making structure. It would be for the authorities in those countries to make sure that the combined use of derogations, and I say again, derogations are an option, not a requirement of the directive, um, that they are consistent and that the numbers would be consistent with regard to uh, the member state. Um, how knowledge is shared across member states? Well, I mean, obviously we now have a tool which provides for all the countries what the derogation reporting is made uh, there. And maybe with that tool and with your report, we can have further conversations as to how information could be better shared. I mean, of course, when you come to some of the species like the geese, um, um, and now there's a, an international initiative for the eider duck under the auspices of Ewa that might provide another framework for certain species whereby the whole issue of derogations might be looked at in a more strategic way to make sure that there are no conservation implications. Um, but let's 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 explore that further. In relation to Una, Una's intervention, um, I'm Irish as well, so therefore I'm I'm more sensitive to the failures of my home country. Um, and we have read the Riot Act to Ireland at package meetings in terms of their failure to report and to take the derogations seriously, um, and also in terms of, for example, the use of derogations for species like the herring gull. Um, so we do have those serious conversations with the member state. It hasn't ended up in an infringement at the moment. We don't exclude that possibility. We have other priorities with, with infringements for Ireland at the moment. They keep us busy. Uh, we've had more court rulings against Ireland probably than any other member state um, on nature. And we have a few in the pipeline, including um, on a court application on Natural 2000. So it's just a human capacity issue, but certainly the conversation is there. And the issue of the failure to provide information, serious information in the report has been raised with them on more than one occasion. So they know it. And of course you have to act as well at the national level to, to make sure that the, that message isn't, is, is given prominence in a national as well as an EU context. Thank you. Um, just one last question before we move on to our uh, conclusions. Uh, Barbara, this question was addressed to you. Um, uh, there, there's a question around whether um, you work together with uh, some of the agriculture institutions at the national, at the EU level um, to see how your work can be coordinated with those who are working on um, agriculture. I mean, we always try to to coordinate our work with um, with uh, other organizations. Um, our partners in the countries uh, always try and um, address their the institutions that deal with the environment, amongst which agricultural um, ministries and and fisheries ministries, the forestry ministries, that doesn't mean that they are always um, eh, listened to attentively or uh, taken into account eh, in the decisions of those um, organizations. So yes, we try, um, but it's not always possible for eh, NGOs to to effectively change the ways these other institutions act. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, well, there are tons of questions in our Q&A and unfortunately we can't get to all of them, but uh, we, some of them have been responded to within the chat. So I encourage panelists to respond to the questions that are addressed to you uh, within the Q&A before we end this webinar. Uh, just so that people don't feel like their questions were neglected. They're not, it's just time limitations. Um, and with that, I would like to invite Ariel Brunner to present his concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I, I would invite people to actually read uh, the report. It's, uh, it's, full of, uh, it's full of content. Um, not always pretty content, but, but always interesting. Um, so a few messages uh, I'm, I'm taking home from this report and from the discussion we've just had. So the fundamental one is that we have a cultural problem. And I think Michal is absolutely right that we need to address it at all levels from EU to national, to regional, to local. Um, uh, and it's a problem uh, of, above everything else of nature conservation still not being taken seriously. The fact that countries uh, for 40 years just do not implement whole chunks of the birds directive, or the fact that uh, countries don't bother reporting what they do or issue uh, blanket derogations, which are obviously abusive and kind of nobody does anything about it for many years, it suggests that there is a kind of still systematic failure to see that conservation of nature really matters, that it's not just, you know, some, yeah, we have it on the laws, but it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and this is not unrelated to the terrible state of nature and the crisis and the impacts it's having on us. Um, and today we've been looking at uh, species protection, but as we know, it's not different when we look at uh, protection of sites, of habitats, of everything else. Um, the second thing that I think emerges very well, very clearly from this report is that we still have in too many countries uh, a systematic blurring of the line between what is legal and what is illegal when it comes to hunting. Um, I think the Commission has done a lot of cleanup on that in, in recent decades. I think the situation is a lot better than it used to be. Uh, but we still see authorities and sometimes parts of the hunting lobby pushing in the direction of instead of establishing a very clear line where there is legal hunting and there is illegal hunting, and then people understand that there are things you can do and things that you cannot do. There is this use of the derogations to kind of allow the unallowable with endless uh, legal wranglings, and this still kind of muddies the water uh, within the, the kind of hunting constituency. A much bigger problem that is emerging, and that to be honest, uh, is something that we as BirdLife have not been active enough and we have become active uh, more recently. Um, it emerges very clearly that there are whole sectors that are given a complete free run on destroying nature and on killing animals, essentially agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. Um, leading to those kind of grotesque situations where in many European countries, if you need to cut one tree in your garden, you need to ask for a permit and authorities need to issue a, a derogation and it gets registered by the foresters can cut millions of trees of the same types at the same time of the year with no questions asked. So uh, that's, I th and, and on that one, to answer to the whole, uh, I think there is uh, at least circumstantial evidence that this is actually having large scale uh, population level impacts. Not always easy to assess, particularly in the complete absence of any reporting or, on, uh, or quantification of it. But, you know, if you are logging uh, hundreds of thousands of hectares uh, during the breeding season, you are destroying a lot of nests, including probably the nests of things that are not that common. Um, my next point is about the rule of law. And there uh, I must um, kind of 
uh, a little bit agree agree to disagree with uh, with uh, the Commission, not because I don't appreciate the, the heroic efforts being done by the environment and the nature unit, but I think there is a, 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 a broader problem there. Uh, the respect of the law cannot be based on hardly anyone ever respecting the law, and if something goes horribly wrong, then the police intervenes. Respecting the law should be about respecting the law is the default. Everybody respects the law. Whenever the law gets broken, the police intervenes. And of course, yes, uh, resources are always limited, so you particularly go after the, the worst ki kinds of, of crimes. But um, I'm afraid that in this case, as in other cases around the environment, we are in a situation where the environment is just giving, given too little resources, and at least until this commission also too little mandate, so we get kind of um, overwhelming situations of normalized illegality. Uh, and, and this really needs to stop if we are serious about the new biodiversity strategy um, and, uh, and so on. Um, to be clear on the issue of derogations, we don't have an issue with the use of derogations. Indeed, we would want to see a more systematic use of derogations. We want to see species protection applied in a kind of uniform and serious way so that when there are cases where you need for some reasons to destroy nests or to kill uh, animals, you do it by the book, meaning that you first try to use non lethal methods. And then if those are not enough, then you do the amount of killing that is proportional to the problem you are trying to solve based on good science and you declare it and it goes under some form of, of scrutiny. And we are not seeing that really happening uh, across, across the board uh, for the moment. Um, we absolutely welcome uh, the improvements to the Habit Habitus database by the Commission, the many infringements that the Commission is running, um, uh, but we do need to get the message across to member states that it's not that you will pursue them on the worst of the worst cases, but that you do expect them to clean up the mess across the board and 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 quickly. Um, uh, Michal was absolutely right that the primary tool for doing this needs to be uh, the national courts, and certainly uh, our national partners have very deep, been very busy in national courts for many years. But as we know, there are huge problems of access to justice. And again, there it's not that the Commission needs to solve all the problems of Europe, um, but uh, certainly um, take countries to call to ensure that access to justice is fully granted uh, would make a big difference. And we have seen, I mean, even in the last few days, the UK is kind of on its way out now, is out. Um, but there has been uh, a, a major change to the uh, licensing report, precisely because NGOs have managed finally to go to court and, and win the case. So going to court, whether it's the ECJ or the national courts, actually does bring improvements, um, and we've seen we've seen it time time and again. Uh, I think we are uh, quite heavily out of time, so I would leave it to that. Uh, I'm certainly hoping that uh, we can keep this discussion going. And particularly, I would hope that next time that we uh, meet uh, to discuss this issue, hopefully also with uh, people from national governments, it won't be to discuss the kind of self-obvious issue that the law needs to be respected and that you know, reporting obligations must be carried out and that numbers should not be fake, but we will be discussing the much more interesting issues of how do you actually solve problems of conflicts between wildlife and agriculture, between wildlife and fisheries, between wildlife and wildlife conservation, how can we make our cities uh, more welcoming to wildlife even while we need to very quickly restore them for energy efficiency and things like that, um, which are, I think, a lot more useful debates to be had. Uh, so hopefully that will be the next stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. And um, I'd also like to um, announce that um, 
We will be sharing links to the report, the full version and the summary in the chat. So please make sure you click on that and have a look. And there you can find many details of um, what was shared today. And if you have any questions, then you can get back to the colleagues at BirdLife and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. Um, and with that, I'd like to actually thank um, all the panelists, Michal, Wille, Wille who left, um, uh, Aki, Barbara and um, Ariel. And also thank you to um, Jeremy who was behind the scenes organizing everything. So I really, really appreciated um, this webinar and I hope all the participants found it useful and hope your conversations continue. Have a lovely afternoon.